I put chill. Sam Nestella to Sam. Plants to nuts and a snack. Good day, friends and family. Thank you for being here today. I am Candace Wilson from the Lummi Nation. We welcome you, each and every one of you. Today is Wednesday, September 28th, 2022. The mission of the City Club is to inform, connect, and engage our community to strengthen the civic health of our region. We emphasize civil conversations and listening to others. We begin by acknowledging with humility the land where we are today is the territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people. And it has been this way since time immemorial. We are the Lactamish people, people of the sea. As always, I'd like to thank all of the volunteers who make our program possible. I'd like to thank KMRE Radio Board Director Robert Clark, who is producing today's program, and BTV, who will be broadcasting it for their viewers. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for their support. Bruce and Claudia Disson, Baron Smith Dogger, Attorney at Law, Dean Neal of the Moyot Company Group, Pacific Continental Realty, Village Books, Firehouse Arts and Event Center, the Opportunity Council, Colshan CPAs, Unity Care Northwest, Western Washington University, and Whatcom Community College. Before we get started, here's a preview of next month's program. On October 26, City Club will take a deep look at the well being of the young children in Whatcom County. That brings me to today's candidate forum. We'll be hearing from three sets of candidates, so our team will <clears throat> each be focused. We want our questions today. If you have a question, please, please type it in the Q&A and hit enter. Finally, I'd like to introduce Chris Rory. He is the director of Community Relations for Western Washington University, a member of our program committee, and will moderate today's program. Once again, Haishka, Candace Wilson from Lummi Nation, Kwanstanat, and I'm the Vice President of City Club. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Candace. Uh, I really appreciate the introduction again. As Candace said, my name is Chris Roselli. I'm the Director of Community Relations with Western Washington University, and it's an honor to be able to moderate today's forum. And as Candace said, we have a rather packed City Club program today because we are offering not one, not two, but we are offering three forums as uh, we focus on the upcoming elections of our 40th and 42nd district representatives. Now, the 40th district features two Democrats vying for the position, including incumbent Alex Rammel and challenger Trevor Smith. The 42nd district features two races. Position one features Democrat incumbent Alicia Rule and Republican challenger Tasha Thompson. Vying for the position two seat, left vacant by Sharon Shoemake in a run for the Senate, are Democrat Joe Timmons and Republican Dan Johnson. All of the candidates have been briefed on the rules for this forum. However, I will go through the rules one time for all of our viewers. I will begin each forum by randomly selecting which candidate goes first, and then we'll alternate who goes first for each of the following questions. I will pose questions prepared by our City Club Program Committee, and then take 
questions from the audience. Candidates will have up to 90 seconds to answer each question. We will have a visual timer on the screen that will notify our candidates when their time is nearing. And when the blue timer turns yellow, it means they have 15 seconds remaining. And when the timer turns red, it means that they need to finish their statement and finish. Now, after you have answered the after they have answered the prepared questions, I will ask questions submitted by our audience members via the Q and A function in Zoom. Please feel free to ask questions in the Q and A function, and I will get to them after we go through the prepared questions. Of course, a reminder to our candidates: this is not a debate with points and rebuttals. It's rather a forum to share your platforms and your ideas. Of course, we look forward, as always, to a respectful and thoughtful forum. Okay, so let's get started. We start off first with Alex Rammel and Trevor Smith, who are uh, vying for the 40th legislative district position. Uh, it has come to our attention that Trevor Smith is unable to make it today. Um, however, I do have Alex Rammel here, and we will certainly get an opportunity to ask him some questions as well. Alex, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to everybody at uh, City Club for, uh, for putting this together, along with all the other amazing informative work that you all do. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. All right, are you ready to go? I am. Okay. Do, do I get <laughs> double time, um, yeah. <laughs> or are we doing twice as many questions? I will, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stick with the same format apparently, right? That's what we'll do. Sounds good. Okay, the first question for you, Alex, is what about your experience and background makes you well-suited to serve in the legislature? Well, thanks, thanks for that. Um, so I, just, just as a, a little bit of background, I've been in the legislature now for, for three years. I was appointed uh, once uh, for the second half of a term and, um, and then was elected um, two years ago. So the first time running for re-election. Um, and, you know, my background, uh, I studied environmental policy and planning at Western Washington University. I worked for the city of Bellingham. I worked for uh, Sustainable Connections, helping implement uh, one of the most successful energy efficiency retrofit uh, programs anywhere in the country. Um, while doing that, I um, also served on the board of um, com uh, Coulson Community Land Trust. Uh, community-based uh, um, affordable housing providers who spent a lot of time thinking about uh, what it takes to um, build homes and keep them affordable in our community. Um, and I've, I've also put in a lot of time volunteering, uh, working to elect other candidates um, over the last 15 or so years. So I've spent a lot of time thinking through what, um, what it takes uh, to make government succeed and how we can make it better. Um, my own lived experience, I'm a, a single dad, um, and so have faced challenges that many folks in this community will be familiar with, especially challenges uh, finding uh, homes uh, that are affordable uh, for me and my family. Um, so those are some of the experiences that I, I bring to the state legislature. Thank you, Alex. And the second question is, here in Whatcom County, we perceive an increase in property, in property crime. How do you plan to address this both locally and across the state? Sure, this is, this is one that's um, on, on a lot of folks' minds right now. And I guess the first thing I would say is that we have to make sure we fully understand uh, the nature of the problem. Um, so this is a challenge that we're seeing across the country during the pandemic, um, particularly property crime and several other ca categories of crime uh, have increased. Red states, blue states, um, it really is, uh, seem, seems to be sort of a sociological uh, implication from, from um, you know, some of the conditions of the pandemic. So we need to be thinking through what those challenges are if we're gonna be able to um, correctly deal with the problem. So some of those challenges are, are uh, our uh, space in our courts, um, in the backlog, uh, Whatcom County in particular has a uh, lower per capita uh, number of courts. Um, so we need to uh, think through how we can expand that and address that. Um, our jail capacity has been a real problem, which means, and, and both of those challenges mean that when somebody is apprehended by police, um, they're, we're not able to make sure that justice is swift and certain and fair uh, for those folks. 
We also don't have, um, and then this is again, not unique here, but we, we've got a workforce shortage and that uh, workforce shortage um, extends to the police department. So the last uh, year we significantly increased uh, training for law enforcement in Washington state. We need to continue to do more of that. Um, and so, and then addressing those, uh, those other sort of uh, bottlenecks in the system are, are key parts of the solution. Thank you. The third question is, what would be your preference for funding in the capital budget? Um, can, can you, do, are, are you talking about where do we get the revenue or are you talking about what do we spend money on? What would you prefer to spend our money on? The, uh, uh, Okay, yes. so I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a few things that I've really championed uh, in the capital budget. And you know, it's, it is a five or $6 billion budget. So we need to do a lot of different things with it. But some of the top priorities that I've championed uh, have, have been the clean energy fund. So we've put money into developing um, technology um, and deploying applications uh, for things like microgrids, um, battery storage uh, to improve reliability of our electric system, uh, those kinds of things. I've also been a champion uh, for really um, uh, ramping up funding for the housing trust fund. Um, we don't have enough uh, affordable housing in Washington state. There are some folks for whom the market is not going to be an adequate solution and we need to be able to support building uh, those homes, keeping them affordable. Um, the capital budget is an important part of how we do that. Here locally, we've also really focused on a couple of uh, key things that have just been critical for our community, some child care facilities, um, both in Anacortes and, uh, and in Bellingham, uh, and have also focused on um, addiction treatment and recovery center, the Dick Wallach uh, facility uh, near Anacortes, um, managed by the Swinomish tribe. That's a model I'd love to see expanded, by the way. Thank you. The next question is, according to ferry officials, 45% of Washington state ferries sailing the route connecting Anacortes to the San Juan Islands ran behind schedule this year because of crew shortages and higher traffic volumes. How would you work to address this? Yeah, and so this is um, this is one of the challenges that um, that I did not come into this office anticipating having to deal with, but um, have have quickly had to come up to speed on. Um, and we've done a lot of important work laying the groundwork. So there's two problems really underlying um, ferry service in Washington State right now. Um, the the short term problem it, that that um, underlies most of the missed sailings and delayed sailings that we have right now is workforce. Um, and this, again, same as we were talking about a minute ago with law enforcement, um, it's, it's rampant in many sectors in um, the state's economy. Uh, we've we've got to make sure uh, we're bringing folks in and we're retaining them. And so what we did in the last year is we um, improved the, um, the retention uh, system for, we, we had this arcane system where we let people go in the winter because we didn't do as many sailings and then see if they come back and rehire them. We got rid of that. So those folks are gonna stay on through the winter. We'll keep them employed, keep them working with the ferry system. The other big thing we've done on that is make sure that um, we're helping people get certification and training. If you go on the ferries and talk to folks, they've got a list of um, different certifications through the Coast Guard uh, that they need to get. So that's, that's the workforce piece. We're helping folks get those trainings and, and, and be able to move up through the ranks. We also have to build more ferries. That's a long-term challenge, um, but the ferry service reliability in the long-term, we're going to need to do a lot more. So we put $350,000 this year towards uh, workforce training, and we put more than a billion dollars towards building new um, ferries. Um, so that's, those are some of the big pieces. I can go on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and a reminder to our audience members, of course, if you do have any questions for Alex, please put them in the Q&A uh, as well. The next question for you, Alex, is uh, uh, please describe a time in your life when you had to summon courage to do something difficult. Um, trying to think of something that isn't uh, directly related to public speaking and being in forums. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I, I guess I'm just trying to think, I mean, it's, it is perhaps more mundane and there's not one sort of simple instance in it, but I, you know, I will just 
revert back to, you know, talking about parenting, which is, you know, a terrifying job. Um, and when you're a parent, um, there's, there's kind of a moment that, you know, other folks I talk to, it sort of dawns on you how responsible you are for somebody else's uh, life and trajectory and well-being. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, that is, you know, my relationship with my son um, and um, taking on that responsibility at that moment in my life was um, was challenging and is something that, um, you know, it's, to this day, the, the thing that I have done that I'm the most proud of. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, uh, there, there's no, there's never a manual on how to parent. That's for sure that every parent can, can identify with. Uh, Homelessness, a continuing challenge for communities around our country. Uh, what solutions do you have that you could come up with to help solve the problems that we have in the broad spectrum of homelessness? Yeah, and I think the broad spectrum is, is the key to success there, right? There isn't a single solution. Um, folks fall into homelessness for a variety of reasons, and so we need a multifaceted approach to, to help folks um, get out of that cycle. Um, so I guess, you know, part of that is um, expanding um, access for behavioral health services um, in particular. That's been a challenge. Just folks who need help getting uh, medication, uh, reminders on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of those um, supports fell through the cracks during the pandemic and and people um people sort of uh, lost that connection to the help that they were getting that was helping keep them stabilized um that's a big piece of it obviously um you know for many folks struggling uh with homelessness they're also struggling with um addiction and um supportive services um like the recovery navigator program to help people um get back on their feet and figure out all of the things that it takes um, to be able to, um, to recover. The Digwalik uh, Center in Anacortes that I mentioned, I think is the, the optimum model for how we can do that. Because folks need help, not just with, um, you know, um, substance abuse, you know, saying no, but they also need help with um, um, all of the sort of add-on services, their, their health, their childcare, transportation, et cetera. And then the, the last thing I, I mentioned is that Bottom line, cost of housing is driving people into homelessness. Um, our housing costs are up here. And um, there's the statistic that's out right now is that for every $100 increase in average area rents, you see about 9% increase in homelessness in that area. So we've got to tackle the housing crisis too. Okay, thank you, Alex. And the final question is, is there any other thing that you would like to say to persuade voters to choose you as their representative. Is this my conclusion statement? Or are we going to do is, this? Is this is your conclusion statement? Right. Yeah. So um, I, I will just say um, thank you so much um, to all the folks who um, have supported this campaign and supported my candidacy um, so far. Um, obviously, we were overwhelmed with uh, this support we saw in the in the primary election. And really grateful. I know a lot of uh, folks that have supported this campaign are in the audience and, and just so much gratitude to all of you. Um, it's humbling. Um, to me, this job is really about teamwork. A uh, legislator gets one vote. You need 50 votes to get halfway to passing a bill in the House. And so you really have to be a team player. Um, I tried to do this job in a way that um, exemplifies that uh, that team attitude, working closely with uh, seatmates, uh, Senator Love, uh, Lovett and um, Rep. Um, Deborah Lekanoff uh, in the 40th, but also working uh, closely with our neighbors in the 42nd district. Um, Alicia and Sharon have been fantastic partners um, and uh, working you know, with other members of the legislature. And I, I think I would just emphasize that you know, our, my colleagues in the House Democratic Caucus selected me to join the leadership team. Uh, and to serve as the deputy whip. So I think that speaks to me as a vote of confidence uh, for that sort of team player approach um, that I try to bring to the way that we do this job. Um, and I will wrap it up there. Thank you so much for the, the chance to uh, plug in on this event today. Alex, thank you so much for your time. I also wanna thank you for uh, stepping forward to serve public office and be a representative for the people in our communities. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right. On to our second forum uh, between Alicia Rule and Tasha Thompson. Uh, 
I'm, I, oh, there they are. All right. I wanted to make sure that you popped up onto the screen here for me here. All right. There is Tasha. Okay. Well, good. Welcome to the two of you. Thank you so much for A, taking the time to step forward to run for public office and serve our communities. We really do appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have two candidates vying for our 42nd district position. One, Representative. And those candidates, as I've mentioned, are Democratic incumbent Alicia Rule and Republican challenger Tasha Thompson. I want to welcome to the both of you again. I flipped a coin and Tasha, you get to be the one to answer the first question first, and then we will alternate each following question. And again, reminder to our guests uh, who are watching, please feel free to use the Q&A function if you have any questions for our candidates. Okay, are you ready to get started? Yes. All right. The first question, Tasha, why are you interested in joining the legislature and what qualifications do you bring to the position? Thank you. Thank you for this uh, forum and uh, an opportunity to introduce myself and explain who I am and why I'm running. As a 25 year veteran of law enforcement here in, in Bellingham, I believe the experience and talents that I developed in 25 years uh, are very applicable to the skills necessary to be successful in Olympia such as uh, collaboration and teamwork, ability to read, interpret, and apply law and policy, ability, ability to communicate effectively with people from all walks of life, and ability to find common ground with someone who literally has told me <laughs> they hate my guts. Throughout my career, uh, when working with a group or committee, the question was never about political affiliation, but rather what was our common goal? Uh, we fought to find what united us rather than what divided us, that diversity in thought prevented tunnel vision because tunnel visions, no matter if they're red or they're blue, can be negative because there's only one way in or one way out. I believe my street level experience will bring a unique perspective, which will be an asset in Olympia. Uh, but I am who I am today because of my parents growing up on a dairy farm here in Linden. They taught me if I wanted something, I needed to work for it. And that in the middle of the night when the barn froze over or the floods came, it was not the government that saved us, but our neighbors. And that is who I will be representing when I am legislator uh, in office. My promise is to be open to ideas and collaborative with everyone while also being fiscally conservative and accountable to the people of my community, conscientious of the decisions I make and the impact on their freedoms and give space for people to shine. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Alicia, same question for you. Why are you interested in joining the legislature again? And what qualifications do you bring to the position? Thank you so much for asking the question. And thank you to all of you who have invested your time today to engage in this civic dialogue. I appreciate the opportunity, <clears throat> pardon me, to be here with you today. Uh, it has been a life's honor to represent you in our legislature. Um, my background, I, I was born and raised here in Whatcom County. My family's been here for multiple generations and I care so much about this place and the people who live here. As a, a social worker for my lifetime, I have dedicated my life to service and that is true in the legislature as well. I've really enjoyed and felt honored to be able to represent you in some really challenging times to make sure that we are building policy and building our budget around things that work for your everyday lives. I am really proud of my ability and my, um, I think bringing in my social work background to work with Democrats and Republicans. It's been really important during these times to put people first and put politics second. And that's something that I'm proud of and I'm committed to continue doing. I'm proud of my most, the most bipartisan record in the legislature. Um, I am really looking forward to continued work in building out a mental health system that works for everyone. <clears throat> Pardon me. As somebody who has experience owning a private practice and working in the mental health field for many years, I think it's really important that we continue to work on building out a, a program that works. We don't have a mental health system that is whole and functioning and it's impacting everything, including public safety. So I look forward to continuing the work um, on Alicia. behalf of you and those in the-, in Thank the you. Thanks, Alicia. 
The next question is back for you, uh, Alicia. The second question is, do you support Governor Inslee's proposal to phase out gas vehicles by 2035? Why or why not? Yes, I do think it's really important that we move toward a clean energy future. And we need to do that in a way that makes sense for the people who live here now and in the future, including our future generations. It's really important to me that we make policy that works for my kids and their kids and our future generations. It's also important to me that we do that in balance with what works economically with those um, that are most vulnerable in our community, especially our families. I'm particularly concerned with those who live in the rural areas of our district like me, because we do extra driving and we might live out here because this is what we can afford. So while I think we need to continue moving forward with really smart policy, ensuring that we're making um, the best decisions for our future for climate, we also need to be very sure that we're doing that in a way that's affordable for everybody so that nobody has to make impossible decisions like the cost of groceries versus can they actually afford to go to work versus an electric car. I know I can't afford that right now. We need to make more affordable solutions as we move forward in this um, really important work. Thank you, Alicia. The same question for you, Tasha. Do you support Governor Inslee's proposal to phase out gas vehicles by 2035? Why or why not? Uh, thank you for the question. And of course, I want to em emphasize I am also um, very supportive of clean air and clean washer and water initiatives and for making sure that my daughter and my granddaughter um, have clean air and um, water in the future. And I think that there are some great ways that we can do this. As far as supporting electrical vehicles, uh, to answer the question directly, by 2030, I think that's a far too, um, I think it's too high of an initiative and it's going to impact people who can't afford, as uh, Alicia, alluded to can't afford electrical cars and we do not have the infrastructure to support such an initiative at this time. Do I think that having a long-term goal of that is good, but to set such a um, onerous timeline on it, it, we're gonna cost, it's gonna cost the people way too much. As I said in my initial statement, um, fiscally conservative is what I really want to focus on because we've already spent $15 billion surplus five billion of it on environmental things. And we are not really going to be set up to, to be completely electrical vehicles in that time frame. And so we are setting ourselves up for failure. I support innovative ideas and always support people that come up with innovative ideas, but trying to set a timeline, you uh, set yourself up for failure, I think. Thank you, Tasha. The next question, Tasha, is back to you again. All right. Do you support Washington State's position on abortion services? Well, the abortion question has been a big one um, uh, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And a lot of people thought that initially would mean that we no longer would have access to abortion here in Washington State, which is false. The abortion um, rights that are in this state were through the initiative process, not once, but twice. And uh, the people have spoken that we they want uh, access to abortion here in this state. And so I do not oversee, I will not um, be looking to change any of that. What I would like to see is more uh, opportunities for life. The adoption process here in this state is difficult and expensive. And I would like to, and there are a lot, many families, some whom I work with that were unable to conceive and would like to have easier access to adoption. And I would like to invest in those options and opportunities for people to be able to have children when they want them. And so that is a, gonna be a focus. And I think that will also promote a best, I will be working on promoting a better foster care system in this state because, and I think Alicia could probably speak to this, that our foster care system is broken. It costs us a lot of money in lawsuits because of, um, we haven't invested properly in that system. And so I will be really focusing on things that promote life and happiness in our children through the adoption and foster system. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Alicia, the same question for you. Um, do you support Washington State's position on abortion services? I am pro-choice because I always believe that a woman has the innate right, right and ability to make choices for their own body. 
historically in the 42nd district, we've had more bills come out of this district than any other to restrict those rights. So I believe this is on the ballot. I think it's very important that we come in with um, a clear stance on this and that we support a woman's right to choose. Um, with that said, I do appreciate that we need to continue work in the foster care system and the adoption system. I'm somebody who's worked as a social worker in, in some pieces of those my whole life. So those things are important as well. But this is a question about choice and women have the innate right as an American to be able to access the reproductive health care that they need. Thank you, Alicia. And the next question goes back to you, Alicia. The question is, do you support the ongoing negotiations between the tribes, farmers, and the Department of Energy concerning water rights? What are your ideas about allocating water to all constituents? Yes, thank you. This is really an important question because it has to do with the future of um, both of those things, both fish and farms moving forward together for our community. I've been working very closely with the Office of Emergency Management on many things. And something that's very clear to me is the importance of sustainability of both fish and farms right here in our backyard. So I always encourage and support any time that we can come together and work toward practical, pragmatic solutions that will work for our whole community. Thank you, Alicia. And the next question, uh, Oops, I'm sorry. I'm still with you, Tasha. I'm sorry. <laughs> <It's> all good. <laughs> Got a whole list of stuff here. Right. Uh, the question goes back to you again, Tasha. Um, it is the question is: Do you support the ongoing negotiations between the tribes, farmers, and the Department of Energy concerning water rights? What are your ideas about allocating water to all constituents? Uh, yes, I support any good conversations that we can have because. Um, Whatcom County is an agricultural um, industry. That is one of, one of our sustainable industries here in this uh, district, and we need to support a uh, good conversation and collaboration for all people to live cohesively and, and for everybody to live cohesively in this uh, district. We have to have um, good water policy. And one of the things that we can do better is good water management. We, I, I've been working with flood survivors through the Whatcom Long-Term Recovery Group. And you know, one thing that we all that has been obviously a big discussion is, is flooding and how do we manage our flooding? And it's not necessarily that we have a water shortage, it's that we have a water management issue. When we have too much water, we're not storing it properly or, or finding some way to corral it so that we can use it for when we don't have enough water so that everybody can have full access to water all throughout the year. And then we have these devastating impacts of having um, entire towns being wiped out. And so I am going to continue the passion that I've been doing all summer and working with the flood survivors because as we come into flooding season again and nothing has been done to manage the water, uh, there's a lot of fear and apprehension that's starting to get raised. And I want to work on those water management issues so that we can sustain our farming and our fish here in this community, but also keep people safe from the flood waters. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. The next question, back to you, Tasha, is what is your assessment of election integrity in Washington state? <laughs> wow, we're hitting all the really good ones this time around, aren't we? <laughs> um, well, you know, as, an, as a police officer, I was a detective for six years. And so at the doors when I'm doorbelling, you know, this has never been something that I've really thought a whole lot about or paid a whole lot of attention to. Um, but at the doors that I'm hearing it significantly more often from both sides of the aisle concerns about election integrity. And what I learned as a detective is if there is a will that people will find a way. And so as a detective, it was my job to always figure out where is the weakest point? Where could it occur? Not that I'm not saying that it is or it isn't, but is there flat evidence to confirm, confirm that it is or it isn't? And I never, uh, I always am open to being proven wrong or proven right, you know, and that's what you do when you go and you look for the facts to, to assert. So I've looked in and I've talked to uh, several people in the voting things. I know there are some areas that are uh, more accessible to being um, 
uh, to undermine the integrity of the voting system that I think that we can, I'm not saying that there is a in voter integrity, but as a detective, I go, okay, that's an area that someone could potentially, if they wanted to, weaken our integrity system. And so uh, I'm open to collaborating with anyone to make sure our voting system is uh, fully safe and that people have confidence in it because this is one of the biggest and most important things that people could do is vote for their uh, representatives. Thank you, Tasha. Alicia, same question to you. What is your assess assessment of election integrity in Washington state? I have full confidence in, in our electoral system in Washington state. Um, in good conversation in 2020 with our then Secretary of State, which happened to be a Republican, I was able to gain a level of confidence that I think um, I'd love to share with you. She has been a leader in this area and has done a great job of ensuring that people have access to um, be able to vote. And our mail-in system is really effective and I'm proud of it and happy to be supportive of it and have confidence in it. Thank you. Could you please describe, I'm oh, sorry, Alicia, could you please describe a time in your life when you have had to summon courage to do something difficult? Thanks, I'm happy to answer this question because it helps me to think back to all the times that I have had to summon courage like so many of us. Um, life is messy sometimes and a lot of times we have to lean in on situations that we weren't expecting. I spent my, many of my, earlier years as a social worker. And so I was going into precarious situations regularly. Um, in fact, to the point where I look back and I wonder what was I thinking? <laughs> but because of that, I was, uh, you know, really have learned a lot about what happens in people's homes sometimes and the risk to children. And I think every day that I worked that job, waking up, getting up in the morning, going into difficult neighborhoods and into precarious situations on the behalf of children was something that took courage. I also think that um, that has been something that I've been able to do in other positions as well. Running for office takes an immense amount of courage and continuing to stay in office takes courage. It's hard. Um, we have to make decisions, big decisions regularly. And we know that these decisions impact the daily lives of the people who live in our district. That's my neighbors, my, my friends, my um, community members and the children who live in this district. And I think that takes a lot of courage and I need to summon it regularly. Um, also I have a teenager, that counts as well. <laughs> I understand the teenager part. Tasha, the same question for you. Please describe a time in your life when you have had to summon courage to do something difficult. Wow, uh, when you ask Alex, Alex this question, uh... It, it's hard as a law enforcement officer for 25 years, every situation, every traffic stop, I was aware it could be my last traffic stop. Every door I knocked on in a domestic violence situation, I knew I might not come out of that situation. And so every single day I went to work and I would kiss my husband and hug my daughter because I knew it might not be the day that I got to come home from work. And so I, this isn't just about me, this is every law enforcement person in this state and every man and woman that I had the honor to serve with shoulder to shoulder uh, makes these decisions every single day. Most recently in our life, of course, when my husband was shot in the line of duty and everything that I worried about for 25 years uh, came into our house. Um, and I found out the exact same time as my daughter because it came through our phone while we were in the truck that we found out that he had been shot. And trying to stay strong when I wanted to lose my completely lose it because she was in the car and how I reacted was going to impact her for the rest of the life. And knowing that I would have that impact on her, I needed to be strong. And I was strong and we've come through it and we are being stronger because of it. So thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Another question is, what does, oh, sorry, Tasha, this question is for you. Yeah. What does fiscally conservative mean to you? Fiscally conservative means how can we do the job that we need to do while being completely responsible for the money? The government does not make money. The government is spending the people's money. And it is our responsibility to the people to be accountable for how every dollar is spent and find ways to do the job 
as as not as cheaply because cheap isn't always the best way to do things but can how can we be most responsible for how we spend their money because they're entrusting us with their money so when i say i'm going to look at something and be fiscally responsible that is what i'm referring to is i recognize that every dollar that we are spending is a dollar that we take from someone's pocket and their ability to to provide for their families and so I, I that weighs heavy on me when making decisions on how to spend people's money. Thank you, Tasha. Alicia, same question for you. What does physically, I'm sorry, fiscally conservative mean to you? Um, really, we are the stewards of your money. And it's really important that we look at every program and every dollar spent in a way that's effective, delivers outcomes and serves you. For me, that means taking a look and a second look at each program, ensuring that we're doing it in a way that serves the community. Thank you. And I've got one more question before our final one. Do you support the idea of providing financial support to Wacom farmers to invest in extra work to improve the environment, like measures to increase carbon sequestration in the soil and others? That question goes to Alicia first. I'm sorry, would you repeat that one more time? Yes, I will, yes, for myself as well. Uh, the, the, the question that came in is, do you support the idea of providing final financial support to Whatcom farmers to invest in extra work to improve the environment? We'll leave the question at that. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. What I hear is a concern about, uh, would I support um, incentives for farmers to move forward in environmentally um, protective practices. And yes, I think that's a great way to move forward with some of these really difficult policy um, decisions that we have to make. We need to support farmers. Farmers produce our food and that's important to us. We know how important it is to be able to enjoy that good local cheese and the most beautiful berries that are in the world right here. We also know that climate change is real and we need to move forward in ways that is going to protect um, not only climate change, but also just generally protect our environment. A good way to do that is to support our farmers through incentives. So thanks for asking the question. Thanks, Alicia. Tasha, the same question to you. Do you support the idea of providing financial support to Wacom farmers to invest in extra work to improve the environment? I think at, at the, just the straight answer is yes. Um, that's kind of a complex question and because there's no, no specific thing. And so there's financial investments. I know that as a, uh, someone that comes from the farming um, background, we, I grew up on a dairy farm. Um, we are, farmers are the best stewards of their land because they recognize the land is what provides for their living. And farming, and you'll every farmer I know will tell you that farming it's not a way to make fun money. Farming is a passion. It's a way of life. It's almost, it's intuitive. You just have to be a farmer and anything that we can do to support them to have better um, farming um, stewards of the land because they know that in the future when they wanna give their farm to their grandchild or their son and grandchild that um, having a very healthy farming community uh, and, and the best um, stewards of the land Will, will promote their children to be better farmers in the future. And so any incentives for helping that, as long as there's no barriers, um, but that's such a complex question. So on its face, I'm going to say yes. Uh, I would promote anything to promote a better farming community and stewards of the land, which is what they are already. Thank you, Tasha. And your final question for this forum, uh, and Tasha, it will be you first. Is there anything you would like to add that would encourage voters to choose you? Oh, well, thank you for this question. Um, you know, as a law enforcement officer for 25 years, and we didn't really touch on any of the crime issues going on uh, in our community, and uh, which is one of the biggest things, but uh, impacting our communities, there is no one in the legislature right now um, that has any law, current law enforcement experience. Most of them at least have been a decade since they've been in law enforcement. And uh, I have the law enforcement uh, knowledge and expertise to do what is necessary to get our laws 
correctly written so that we can empower our police officers to do the jobs that they need to do to uh, protect our communities. What we saw the last two years was a lot of legislation written um, based off impacts and in incidences that did not even occur in our state. You know, I have the, you know, we, you would come to a trial and you have expert testimony for certain instances in a trial because we respect their expertise. I have the expertise in criminal justice to the, do the job that is necessary to support and empower our police officers and support our criminal justice system so that we can get public safety back on track. We are way off track and um, me just advocating someone, you lose something in translation, I need to be at the table. Law enforcement needs to be at the table to be able to get things right. And so that is why I'm running and I would ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Alicia, the same question for you. Is there anything you would like to add that would encourage voters to choose you? Yeah, thanks for asking the question. I appreciate that I have the support of both Republicans and Democrats. I have the support of business and labor, and I have the support of the sole support of the Fraternal Order of Police, the um, local firefighters, and the Teamsters who work in the jail. It's because I've worked hard, <clears throat> pardon me, with all parties to bring everybody to the table to really deliver uh, policy solutions that work for your everyday lives. That's important to me and I'm committed to continuing doing that work. Um, I believe that the ability and commitment to working with both sides of the aisle makes me a leader that isn't replaceable. And I will be committed to continuing to do this work in all spheres. Um, particularly public safety, which is something that I have worked very hard on. I did not vote to support many of the law enforcement reforms you're hearing about, but I've worked hard with partners to move forward solutions that we can get um, moving. And we've got more work to do there. So I am just getting started and I'm looking forward to being able to continue the work on your behalf. And I really appreciate, it's a total honor to be able to serve you. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Well, Alicia and Tasha, thank you both very much for being here today. Thank you also for stepping forward to serve as our representative in our communities. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you very much. All right, on to our third and final forum that we have here, rounding out the forum. We have two candidates vying to be our 42nd district position two representative. Now those candidates are Republican Dan Johnson and Democrat Joe Timmons. I want to welcome both of you for being here. Thank you as well for taking the time to step forward to be a representative in our community and to serve the people of Whatcom County. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having us today. Much appreciated. Absolutely. All right, so the first question, oh, let me see. Oh, I flipped my coins last night. I got to check and see what I did. Okay, Joe, I flipped the coin and you get to be the one to go first to answer the first question. What are your credentials to run for public office and why are you interested in running? Thank you, and Chris, can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to City Club for inviting me. Um, I think these sort of discussions in a respectful way are so important to uh, our community. Uh, I previously worked at Western Washington University in government relations and helped uh, organize the, the Monroe Institute, the Monroe Seminar for Civic Education, another, another forum like this that provides uh, 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 respectful information and in, in a way that, that is uh, key to our democracy. All that said, um, you know, I am running because I love Whatcom County. I'm running because I think that I have the experience and the relationships to hit the ground running on behalf of Whatcom County in the legislature. Um, you know, I've spent the last decade working at local, state, and federal levels of government uh, after receiving a master's degree in public administration from the University of Washington. Uh, and that includes nearly eight years directly working in state government, currently working in the governor's office as our Northwest Washington regional representative, previously at Western and government relations, where I helped advocate on behalf of the university and its students uh, to bring resources from Olympia to campus to, to meet growing uh, student needs, including capital funding projects, um, which stimulate local economy. So I, I understand how Olympia works. Um, I understand um, 
uh, how, to, how to be effective on behalf of our community there. And I believe I share the values of Whatcom County residents and I look forward to serving them in Olympia uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Dan, the same question for you. What are your credentials to run for public office and why are you interested in running? Thank you for the question and thanks for having me on today. It's a, it's an honor to be a, a part of this process. I have, I was a business owner for several years, raised in a family business, and uh, that was the towing and recovery industry. And to directly answer the first part of that question is credentials. As a member of the Towing and Recovery Association of Washington, which is our industry lobby, I was on uh, of one of many committees, but one of which was the legislative committee, which annually would put me down there in Olympia, where I would testify in front of uh, various committees about legislation pertaining to not only our industry, but public safety and other items wrapped around our industry. And it, over the course of amendments or policy making or so forth, it was a very, uh, a very enlightening process. And I did gain a lot of knowledge about policy making in Olympia. And a lot of people ask, you know, how well do you work with uh, people across the aisle? The bipartisan question. And the answer is that in our industry, we were very much bipartisan. We would uh, talk to both sides of the aisle and work towards the the common goal, which was uh, the policy passage. And we did that, I won't say flawlessly, but we did it very, uh, very successfully over the years. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. The next question, Dan, back to you. Do you believe individuals should be allowed assault weapons? And what is your overall view of gun control measures? Can you define an assault weapon for me? Good question. We'll leave the, de the definition of assault weapon uh, up to you as candidates. Okay, perfect. And sorry, but could you repeat that question then? Because I bet. got hung up on the first part of it. Absolutely. Do you believe individuals should be allowed assault weapons what is your overall view of gun control measures? I think that the the gun control that exists in Washington state is probably some of the strictest in our land. And, you know, the other part of your question is regarding assault weapons. And there have been a lot of different definitions thrown around about what an assault weapon actually is. And so for lack of definition, I think I'm going to leave that alone. But coming back to it, uh, with regards to gun regulation, I think a, a lot of things that people miss and, and overlook is the fact that when a gun is used in a crime, it's a, a vehicle and it's more the, the mental capacity of the person using it or the motivation, but it's a, it's a thing that's a byproduct of what's really going on. And so you can look at it as uh, people that maybe are in a bad place mentally or they're motivated by money and they're using a firearm for the commission of a crime. But um, I do think that the legalization of opiates has opened a door for criminals to retain gun possession, which I don't think is something anybody is really wanting or looking forward to. And I think that uh, going back and addressing the opiate issues would then close that door in many ways, make our state safer. Okay, thank you, Dan. Joe, same question for you. Do you believe individuals should be allowed assault weapons? And what is your overall view of gun control measures? Thank you, Chris, for this question. It is, uh, it is very important. You know, when I go door to door, public safety is on top of people's minds, right? Um, you know, I, I was in eighth grade when Columbine happened. Um, I, I believe we have uh, an epidemic in this country of uh, mass shooting incidents that cause great harm to individuals and communities. Uh, I think that those are uh, largely taking place because individuals have military style firearms. I don't believe that those are necessarily needed for personal protection. I wholeheartedly believe in the Second Amendment and the right to protect people. Uh, it's a dangerous world out there. I get that. I think people need to be able to protect themselves and their families. 
Uh, I don't think military style weapons are necessarily needed in order to do that. Um, so with that in mind, I, I want to applaud the legislature for steps that they've taken in recent years. You know, we the legislature passed a, a, a restriction on ghost guns, which are unregulated and dangerous. Um, they passed a, a ban on, on the sale of high capacity magazines to limit the number of rounds that can go in weapons that can release uh, ammo in 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 way too short of a time. So uh, I want to applaud the legis legislature on that. And, and I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility and, and look forward to, uh, to keeping up the work in this state to help keep people safe. Thank you, Joe. Joe, the question, uh, the next question comes back to you. And that question is, we have a statewide lack of affordable housing. Are there steps the legislature can take to help alleviate the situation? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the, the legislature um, has been taking steps and I think we need to be looking at it in a much more uh, holistic way. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I'm proud to, to live in Bellingham, to, in Whatcom County. My wife grew up here, We're proud to set down roots and be raising our two-year-old here. Uh, our rent went up 35% in Bellingham last year though. Uh, we're still paying off our student loans. You know, we had a one-year-old at the time. That was very challenging for us. And I know when I go door to door, I'm not alone in that. We have a housing shortage crisis. So I think we need to be looking at the continuum of housing from uh, those for, for the lowest income or, or earners through things like the housing trust fund as representative Ramo mentioned earlier. I think we need to be ramping that up. We have some great projects underway through the Opportunity Council and Mercy Housing in our community to help provide more units uh, for low income residents, but I think we need to be looking at workforce housing. You know, when I talk with the Port of Bellingham, when I talk with the Regional Chamber of Commerce, they, they bring up uh, a housing and childcare every meeting I'm in because those are, those are barriers to our, econ our economy. Businesses can't start and relocate here because there's not enough workforce housing for, uh, for, for people to live here. So I think the state needs to be looking at building more housing. I think we need to be incentivizing building in cities, more density, and particularly around transit lines. And that's something that I would fully, fully support if given the chance to serve. Thank you, Joe. Dan, same question for you. We have a statewide lack of affordable housing. Are there steps the legislature can take to help alleviate this situation? Yes. Uh, to expand on that uh, one word answer, there are steps. And I think that in the beginning, uh, we need to start with, uh, well, we need to stop the bleeding when it comes to the permitting process and how much money is actually being spent before that first shovel full of dirt is even taken out. I mean, it can be in the neighborhood of $50,000 right off the bat. And the next, the next thing we can start looking at is the mainstreaming of the permitting processes where that is a, a very inefficient way. Or it's an inefficient system we currently have. And having been a part of that process myself, I can speak firsthand to it. I think we also need to take a look at the, uh, the things I just mentioned with the permitting prices is as a ratio, every thousand dollars that is raised on the home cost, you're pricing out 2,100 families of being able to afford that house. So that's by every $1,000 is 2,100 families that no longer can afford that house. And when you start exponentially raising those numbers, that's exponentially pricing people out of the market to begin with. So in short, yes, yes, there's a lot in the legislature we can do, but those are the starting points to get us going. Thank you, Dan. Dan, back to you. The next question is what solutions would you support to solve the problems of the 1% of our homeless population who are and will be chronically homeless because of mental illness? Solving homelessness in 90 seconds, uh, as complex of an issue as it is, uh, it's a stretch, but I think I'm gonna focus on just a couple things in that, and that would be uh, mental illness and drug addiction. So one of the things to look at is that Washington State is second only to California in drug overdose fatalities. And with regards to the Blake decision, I believe it was that uh, talked about the, the 
hard narcotics and then the legalization of them and then a temporary fix that was placed in that uh, following session. It's important to know that in 2023, that temporary fix in it in its entirety is going to be done in July of 2023. So what's important is when we get down there in Olympia in this next year's session is that we address these issues of opiates that relates directly to mental illness, which are two leading factors in homelessness. And at that point, we can we can start remedying the problem from its source. And once we can do that, then we start looking at the people that have fallen victim to this problem that still remain. But if we can't stop it from coming in and from happening, then we're just treading water at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Joe, same question for you. What solutions would you support to solve the problems of the 1% of our homeless population who are and will be chronically homeless because of mental illness? Yeah, thank you, Chris. It is, this is a, a question of paramount importance right now. Uh, this, the, the pandemic has been hard on everybody and we've seen uh, mental health and substance use disorder um, be exacerbated by it. So it's definitely on top of mind. I think when it comes to uh, sheltering people, uh, providing shelter for people experiencing homelessness, I think first and foremost, we need to go back to, again, we have a housing shortage crisis. So I think we need to continue to build more housing um, to provide more stable settings for people to live in, uh, to have a roof over their head. Um, this is such a complicated, challenging issue, and I think we need to be using all the tools in our toolbox to address this one. One model that I, that I uh, 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 support is the tiny shelter village model. Um, there's one in, in Bellingham, Garden View, that I've toured recently. Another one in, in Burlington, the Skagit First Step Center. Um, these provide um, a roof over the head uh, for, for people experiencing homelessness to, uh, to store their, to store their um, belongings so they can go look for work or go access uh, uh, services. And then they have wraparound case management services there on site. That's really the missing piece when it comes to this. So I support that model. Um, but as was alluded to we, need to, we need to be investing in our behavioral health. We had a new Whatcom County Crisis Stabilization Center that's doing great work in our community. We need more avenues like that uh, to make sure that people get the mental health and substance use uh, services that, that they deserve. Thank you, Joe. The next question is for you again, Joe. Would you support bills that would limit a woman's right to an abortion and do or don't you support abortion rights? Thank you again, Chris, for this question. You know, I, I am 100% pro-choice. I was proud to speak at the Rally for Row event in, in May in Bellingham to be invited to speak there. Uh, in light of the, of, the, of the Supreme Court decision, we need legislators that are gonna stand up for access to abortion healthcare and to, act, and to stand up for reproductive rights now more than ever. Um, people are gonna say it's not under attack in the state. That's just absolutely false. Every year, Republicans bring bills before the legislature to restrict or ban a woman's access to abortion. If I'm given the chance to serve, I will stand every time with a woman's right to choose. I think it's a personal private decision between a family and a doctor. I support that wholeheartedly. And, and I think it's really important that voters know where candidates stand on this issue because this is under attack. This is under attack in every state in the union, including ours. And it's something that I would proudly stand up for to ensure that, 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 that women have access to abortion healthcare and that their reproductive rights are protected in the state. Oh, and, and I'll just say too, on, on top of that, very proud to have the endorsement of Planned Parenthood and Pro-Choice Washington in this race, organizations that, that help advocate on these important issues, and I'm just honored to have their support. Thank you, Joe. Dan, the same question for you. Would you support bills that would limit a woman's right to an abortion, and do or don't you support abortion rights? Thank you for the question, Chris. Uh, Washington voters have already voted in 1970 and 1991 through the Citizens Initiative process, and that has legalized the woman's right to choose in Washington state. And moving forward, I think that the residents of Washington state should be the ones to change it. Thank you. 
just to follow up, Dan, on that, the first part of the question, would you support a bill that would limit a woman's right to an abortion? Would I support a bill that would limit a woman's right to an abortion? So I've been asked this question a few different times, a few different ways, and please don't take any offense to this when I say this, but I would have to, I would have to have a bill in front of me on just about any issue to tell you if I support it or not, because I think as maybe Joe can tell you as well, the complexities of the written word and bill form are, are so extensive that we would have to really examine every part of that bill before we knew whether we were going to support it or not. So I, I can't sit here today in a forum and tell you whether I support or don't support a bill that I, I don't have a privilege of, of reading and reviewing. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dan. The next question that I have is, um, uh, let's hear, and it is, Dan, back to you this time. Do you believe that climate change is real and how should the legislature address this issue? Do I believe climate change is real? You know, I think that we can all speak to the, the same, if, if it's a Venn diagram, we can all be in the same area on that diagram that we all want clean air, we all want clean water, and we all want to protect the environment. In fact, the United States is a world leader in uh, energy efficiency, and Washington State also leads the country in as much. Uh, I do feel that working towards these goals and getting there, we have found ourselves in a situation where it has uh, prohibited the proper management of not only our river systems, but also our forest trees, our forest or forests, I guess is the best way to state that. And by that, I mean, you know, annually we have forest fires that very much so affect the clean air that's in the air. we. It affects the air we breathe. I guess moving forward, the thing I, I really want to focus on is that in the in the name of climate change, there have been uh, bills that have been passed that it seems like they they raise taxes or costs to consumers, but don't do much to actually fix the problem of what people are saying is climate change. And I'm referring to a 46 cents a gallon uh, gas increase that we're going to be seeing at the end of this year. Thank you, Dan. Joe, same question for you. Do you believe that climate change is real? And how should the legislature address this issue? Thanks, Chris. Uh, I, yes, I, I absolutely believe climate change is real. And, and I don't think we need to look any further than what we're experiencing in Whatcom County to see that. We are experiencing more severe flooding every year. We're experiencing more severe wildfires every year that impacts the lungs of, of our community and that, that risks uh, people's homes and, and destruction. So yes, absolutely, I think climate change is real. I think elected officials have an obligation to do something about it because I want my two-year-old, I want my kid to be able to grow up and live on this planet. I want my, my kids' kids to be able to grow up and live in our community and not have these severe threats year in and year out that are growing in severity. Now, that said, what can the legislature do about it? The legislature has done a lot about it already. They passed the Climate Commitment Act recently. Uh, that's a very ambitious piece of legislation. I want to see that come to fruition before we take any additional steps. I think it's important to, to, to build off of progress before making drastic changes. So, uh, so I support that. But let me say this, too. You know, I, I, uh, I toured homes of, of flood victims, right, after the Nooksack flood. I volunteered to help do some cleanup efforts. It is, is a terrible experience to see people's uh, homes destroyed. And I think that in addition to trying to work on climate change, we also need to be working with our state's emergency management to better support local communities in planning and prevention and recovery efforts after these, these disasters occur. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so one topic that we've received a few questions about um, is a recent article in the Bellingham Herald uh, which uh, states that um, Dan, uh, that um, you had um, uh, extremists 
anti-Semitic sexist memes and information on your social media. And um, instead of responding to a specific question, I, I think I'll simply leave it open for you to address Dan to start if, if, if you would. Um, uh, I think uh, that, that if that works for you. Sure, is this, uh, I guess I'll, <laughs> before we start the time, if I may get some clarification, sure. is uh, what I would consider a poorly written, very one-sided article about me, something that Joe and I are both gonna comment on here today, or does Joe get his own question regarding something else? This is, a, that's a good question. This is in response to the questions that I'm getting in the Q and A. Um, and so I'm simply paraphrasing an opportunity for you to, uh, to uh, address the recent uh, article in the Bellingham Herald. Okay, and then Joe will also have a chance to response on how he thinks that that article in the Bellingham Herald was. Uh, I think what we can certainly do is, is if uh, we want to uh, address the question to uh, coverage of media of the candidates, we can certainly keep it keep it at that if you if you would like. Th thank you, Chris. I, I I would like an opportunity to to discuss this if it's posed to to one candidate. If that's okay. Well, I think yeah, this, it's yeah I can. Fun. I'll dive in. I'll yeah, dive it's on in. People's Chris. mind, Dan. It's just on people's minds for sure. So say again. I'm sorry. It is on people's minds for sure. So I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, let's hit it. Ninety seconds. <laughs> I think it's important to know that uh, I'm not a politician. I'm not bred for bureaucracy from the get go. Um, I'm a working man, uh, blue collar. I'm a U.S. Marine, and I haven't always been as polished as some. And with that being said, I would like to take an opportunity uh, opportunity to apologize for the what was considered anti-semitic which was a star of david with a, a vaccine uh, number on it and the parallel was not to compare the losses of COVID 19 to what happened to the the jewish community in the 30s and 40s but more to talk about having to carry a, a card or have some sort of uh, class in society have to identify themselves through some sort of card system or whether that be that star in that application or a vaccine mandate card or a vaccine card, I should say. Uh, for that, I am truly sorry, but uh, nothing else that I'm being accused of uh, was sexist, racist, or malicious in any way, shape, or form that I feel. And so moving forward from this point, I would just like to say that um, it's something I will be more cognizant of if it is uh, bothersome to people. I appreciate that, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, uh, some thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I, I just wanna recognize the, the role of the free press in elections. I think it is extremely important that information gets out about candidates to help make vote to help voters make an educated decision. Uh, as I told the Bellingham Herald, I don't think there's any place for bigotry in the Washington State Legislature, and I believe that candidates and elected officials need to lead by example, and that includes uh, showing the true values and opinions of 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 what they believe, so the voters can make an educated decision. I found uh, the comments of of my opponents. Uh, social media to be offensive. I found it to be appalling. Um, I, I, I do not think that there is room for those sorts of beliefs or views or comments in our civic discourse. And I understand the idea of being frustrated at about a, about a mandate. I, working in the governor, I was frustrated and under so much challenges, but I uh, had restraint to be able to keep my thoughts to myself. And I think it's really important that our elected officials do that. I think it shows uh, a lack of character if you're not able to do that. And I think that, that our leaders need to lead with integrity, to be honest, to be held accountable, and to apologize if, there are, if they make mistakes. 
So I just, I appreciate my opponent talking about this issue. I do think it's on top of people's minds and I, I look forward to continuing um, to, to discuss this issue moving forward. Thanks to the both of you for answering that question. Um, question regarding homelessness, uh, again, um, the question is, um, some feel that Bellingham has become a destination city for homeless people. Um, and I don't know if legislature has a decision or not, but the question is, is would you curtail the Lighthouse Mission's homeless building expansion plans? And what would you do to reduce the homeless population or problem here in Whatcom County? And the question, uh, Joe, you go first this time. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, the, the Lighthouse does great work in terms of, of trying to provide shelter for people experiencing homelessness. And my understanding and, uh, is that this is really a local issue. And so I uh, would let the local uh, government, uh, if that's moving forward, I, I respect that. Um, you know, I've already talked about tiny shelter, uh, home, uh, tiny shelter villages. I support that. Um, talked about behavioral health and, and mental health and substance use disorder. I think we need to be working on that when it comes to supporting people experiencing homelessness. But one thing I'd really like to talk about related to this too is we really need to address the underlying causes of why people become homeless to begin with. I think we need to be having a, an education system that provides pathways for careers and jobs, not only jobs of today, but jobs of tomorrow. And I think we really need to be supporting uh, our behavioral health and mental health efforts uh, to make sure that everybody has uh, supports they need, um, wh whether they're experiencing homelessness, but more importantly, to hopefully prevent homeless in the future. And when it comes to homelessness, you know, we often think of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness on the streets. It is much more complicated than that. We unfortunately have people living in cars. We have people couch surfing. When I worked at Western, I saw students who were couch surfing because they did not have a stable place to live. So I really think that we need to address this issue. Um, I support <clears throat> building more shelters for people experiencing homelessness and just more housing in general. Thank you, Joe. Dan, the same question for you. Uh, some believe that Bellingham has become a destination city for homeless people. Would you curtail the Lighthouse Mission's homeless building expansion plans? And what would you do to reduce the homeless population uh, here in Whatcom County? Uh, to answer the first question, when you talk about the homeless, uh, or I'm sorry, Lighthouse Mission's plans, that's that new structure they're putting together. Yeah. That is correct. The Lighthouse Mission has a, a very long and distinguished history of doing the right thing and taking care of the, the most vulnerable in our society. As far as uh, the second part of that question was uh, what we would do for homelessness. Yeah, what would you do to reduce homelessness here in Markham County? I, I think it goes back to what we had said earlier is finding the root of who is homeless and why. And a lot of that talks about mental illness and drug addiction. And yeah, there are some people living in their cars and that has been the case. I come from the towing industry and I've, I've seen it a lot over the years where folks are living in their cars and RVs and so forth on the city streets. And there are people that want to get to work the, and, be a, a part of society and not live in their Buick. But what happens is they get hemmed up by the system and aren't able to maybe get into a, a house right away or because of availability, because of cost. And then they're forced to stay living in their vehicle. And why they can't get into those is because again of the availability, which as I defer back to earlier when we talk about housing, is what is the cost to build these structures? And it starts with massive, massive permitting costs right off the get-go. And that has to be reined in. Thank you, Dan. I have two more questions for you. Um, here in Whatcom County, uh, and this, uh, Dan, back to you. Here in Whatcom County, we perceive an increase in property crime. How do you plan to address this both locally and across the state? Uh, the increase in property crime, and that goes back to the public safety issues, and that goes back to the the last two, well, 18 months worth of, of legislative sessions and policymaking where we saw such a negative 
police reform host of bills that came through in 2021. And with those, we immediately started seeing all of these rises in crime. And so what needs to happen is, and again, uh, my opponent being a direct representation of the governor's office and the governor, of course, having signed every single one of those bills into law, and my opponent, of course, being somebody who supports as a staffer of the governor is also has to be by default in full support of all of that legislation that has put us into the place we are here today. In that place is rising cost of, or I'm sorry, the rising uh, property crimes and the lawlessness that we're experiencing. We need people that are going to be bold to go back down to Olympia, draw a line in the sand and say, look, enough is enough. People are scared to go into downtown Bellingham because of this. We need to make sure that law enforcement has the tools that they need to do just that, enforce the law. And we need them to do that efficiently and effectively. And I'm willing to go down to Olympia and make sure that that happens. Thank you, Dan. Joe, same question for you. Um, I gotta find it, my apologies. I lost it, my apologies. There is, I know it's, there is a, how about this? I'm going to ad lib it again. Here in Whatcom County, we perceive an increase in property crime. How do you plan to address this both locally and across the state? Thanks, thanks, Chris. And, I, and I'd like to get to answering that question, but I first wanna, wanna comment on something that my opponent just said about myself. Um, he might be misunderstanding my role in the governor's office. I work in the governor's outreach team. I represent the state to local communities in Whatcom County and neighboring counties. I don't advise the governor on whether or not to sign legislation. The bills that, that were passed in recent years were bad bills. I would not have voted for those bills. I didn't have an opportunity to vote for those bills because I wasn't in the legislature. So I don't think it's fair to tie me to legislation that um, I would not have supported to begin with. Um, that said, um, you know, I, I, yeah, crime is absolutely on top of people's minds and it should be, it absolutely should be. You know, I have a two year old. I wanna be able to walk in downtown Bellingham with my son. I want my son to be able to grow up in this community and feel safe. Everybody deserves to feel safe in our community. So I think that we need to be supporting law enforcement to do the, uh, the job um, of keeping our community safe while of course holding bad actors accountable, just like in any other profession. Um, you know, I know that there is some work to try to address the legislation that was passed, including the, the pursuits bill. I'm fully committed to, to working with law enforcement and my colleagues in the legislature next year if I'm elected. Um, and, and I think that we really need to be focused on this issue because it is on top of people's mind. Uh, and I'll just say outside of that too, I'm, I'm very proud to have the endorsement of local firefighters, the Washington State Council of Firefighters, first responders who really address uh, these situations as well. Thank you, Joe. All right, our last question and Joe, we will start with you. What would you like to add to encourage people to vote for you? Thank you, Chris. I, I just, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I really uh, think that these sorts of conversations are essential to our democracy and to helping uh, our, our, our voters be informed as they can be. Um, I love Whatcom County. You know, I've lived, I've lived in Whatcom County for more than a decade. As I said, my wife grew up here. We set down roots here. So proud to be part of this community and to be, be going for this position. I think Whatcom County deserves a, represent, a representative in Olympia that's gonna stand up for their values. And I'll say, you know, part of, part of my values come from a working class household. And my dad is a pipe fitter and my folks created a small business out of our garage when I was five years old. I saw the, I saw the importance of hard work through that. I've dedicated that to a career in public service um, during the pandemic that has led to me helping to establish uh, a small business relief fund uh, to make the case for that and to work with the Department of Commerce, which more than 100 businesses and organizations in Whatcom County utilized to help stay afloat during the pandemic. These have been tough years, and I think we have a lot of division, and, and I'm, I'm committed to working across the aisle and to working on behalf of everyone in Whatcom County if I'm elected. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to future conversations. Thank you, Joe. Dan, same question for you. What would you like to add to encourage people to vote for you? Well, I would, uh, of course, this is the longest job interview that I've ever been a part of, right? And that's how I look at it as a, as a representative government 
that elects people to go represent them and then vote democratically in a legislative body. I, I recognize that that is, uh, is who we are as a nation and as our government. And it's about good governance. And, you know, I, I would really like to reach out and thank everybody in the primary election that, that voted for me. I am uh, very humbled by people choosing me to, to move forward to the next step and hopefully into Olympia to, to be their representative and to do good governance. I feel that my experience uh, in the legislature as a, uh, a legislative chair for an industry association has given me a great, great knowledge of how that works down there and the mechanics and the moving parts. That's not to say that there isn't a ton more to learn, but again, very, very, very flattered and humbled that I've made it this part this far as a first time candidate coming from the private sector. And with that being said, I believe we do need private sector solutions in Olympia, not more government. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Dan and Joe, thank you so much for your time to be with us today uh, and taking the time and effort to step forward and run for public office and be a representative for our communities. Uh, once again, I would like to thank all of our candidates for stepping forward uh, to run and be a public representative for us. Ballots will be mailed out on October 21st. Be sure your voter registration information and address are up to date by going to votewa.gov. And don't forget, Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Be well. Thank you all. Thanks, Chris.